Welcome everyone to the worship of Sleaford Methodist Circuit. This is the first in a series of four Sundays on which we're going to be looking at the book of Isaiah. This is part of uh, the uh, national initiative called Bible Month. We are um, a bit later in our circuit doing this than some churches will have done. Some may have already finished by now, but we're going to use the first four Sundays in July to spend 30 days with Isaiah. And before we get into that, uh, just a very brief overview of the book of Isaiah and where it fits into the, the history of the Old Testament. I'm going to do this with, with maps. I have to start with. Uh, a map of the Middle East. You'll recognise the, uh, the end of the Mediterranean Sea, or the Great Sea as it was called in those days. Uh, and Israel is actually quite a tiny part of, the, uh, of, of the, this great land off, off uh, at the end of the sea. Uh, we have here a, a, a sort of blow-up map of uh, Israel. And the history of Israel... Uh, I suppose, began as a nation uh, with the, the 12 tribes of Israel based on the, uh, the sons of, of Jacob, also known as Israel, uh, coming together as a, a nation. So the 12 regions became a nation under King Saul and then uh, under King David and then his son Solomon. But when Solomon died and his son took over, um, many of the tribes didn't like Solomon's son and rebelled against him. And it was only really Judah in the south and uh, its capital city, Jerusalem, which was part of Judah, that, that remained faithful to the line of David, uh, Solomon and his, his sons. The rest of the tribes all broke away and formed their own nation in the north. and They, they retained the name Israel, Judah, in the south became Judah. And for a, for a couple of hundred years, there were two different nations. In the north, they were ruled by a series of uh, different uh, rulers. Uh, there was often a military coup and a new ruler would take over. But uh, in Judah and uh, Jerusalem, it was always the, the descendants of David who sat on the throne. So uh, that's the, the, the history bit. But at the time of Isaiah, uh, the, uh, the beginning of his ministry was uh, when King Uzziah died. King Uzziah was the king in, in Judah. Uh, and famously, you, you perhaps recognise those words uh, at the start of the call of Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Uh, Isaiah actually lived through a, a few kings that followed, but uh, the time of Isaiah had been a relatively peaceful uh, time in political terms, at least. So when he died, things started to get a bit more complicated. There was turmoil of one sort or another. And part of the problem was that one of the uh, nearby nations, or ne sorry, nearby empires, I should say, back to this page, um, Assyria, uh, was starting to throw its weight around. It was becoming an empire and it was expanding its influence and it expanded uh, through the Fertile Crescent down uh, through Israel towards Judah. And actually Assyria conquered the nation of Israel. The, the nation of Israel was defeated. It was no more. But Assyria never quite conquered Judah. It got as far as the gates of Jerusalem, but there it stopped. And part of the story in the book of Isaiah is the miraculous way in, in which that happened and how God looked after the people. But then after another hundred years or so, uh, another empire, which is also marked here, Babylonia, uh, the Babylonian Empire, took over from the Assyrians and they also started to expand and they again came around the same way conquering all the lands that Assyria had conquered uh, and also uh, taking uh, the, the threats to Jerusalem and Judah but this time they did succeed in conquering 
the city of Jerusalem, taking away initially all its leaders, and then later on um, they, they, they destroyed the city, they took away uh, a, a large majority of the population and they took them around to, to Babylon, uh, where they were in exile for 70 years, uh, two or three generations in exile. And it was only then when the Persians, who were off this map somewhere, uh, when they took over from the Babylonians and they expanded their empire, that the, uh, the Persian emperor uh, Cyrus had a, a policy of actually releasing exiles and letting them go back to their homeland. So the conquered people were released and were able to, to rebuild Jerusalem. The, the sec second part of the book of Isaiah deals with that later period in history when uh, Cyrus was allowing the people to go free. Now, this means two things, or it could mean two things. One is that uh, the, the second half was a very powerful and detailed prophecy by the Isaiah who lived a couple of hundred years previously who by the power of God and the Spirit of God working through him was able to describe events far in the future including the name of the Persian Emperor uh, even when the Persian Empire did not exist. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that the later part of the book, chapter 40 onwards, was written by a different person. Uh, not Isaiah himself, but somebody who lived 200 years or so later at the time of the Babylonian exile when the Persian emperor was allowing people to go free. Now, uh, scholars will debate o over this and uh, ordinary Christians will debate over it. One of the things that sometimes gets said, which I don't think is quite fair, is that if you believe in two different authors for the book of Isaiah, then you are denying the power of prophecy. I don't think that's right at all. I think it is perfectly possible to believe in the power of prophecy, to believe that God is able to predict events 200 years into the future, but not necessarily to think that that's what God actually did in this instance. Um, and to me, putting my colours on the mast, nailing my colours to the mast, uh, I, I am quite happy to believe that the later part of Isaiah was written by a different person. And it's not to do with prophecy, it's to do with uh, what he assumes is already the case. He writes as if the readers will know all about the conquering of the, the uh, city by the Babylonians and having been taken off into exile and spent time in exile. And if this was someone writing 200 years before that happened, uh, then wouldn't he have written it differently? Wouldn't he have said, one day in the future you will be taken into exile by the Babylonians and then another emperor will come along and will release you? But it is written as if a lot of these things have already happened and the, the bit that's still uh, in the immediate future is the release and uh, the, the return of the exiled captives back to their homeland. In any case... The book of Isaiah does definitely cover two periods of history. The earlier time when um, Assyria was the, the big threat and uh, was threatening Judah and its very existence. And then the later time when uh, the, the people were in exile in Babylon and they were about to be set free by the Persian emperor. And even though there are two very different settings, some of the, the themes and the ideas uh, come across in, in both parts of the book, which I suppose is why someone somewhere along the way has chosen to look at the book as a whole and not at uh, just the first half of it or the second half, but actually to look at the whole book. But it is 66 chapters long, and that's too long to cover uh, in four Sundays uh, if you've chopped it up into four sections. So... What we're going to do this four weeks is to look at four different themes, four different ideas that come out of the book of Isaiah. And uh, the first one, let's give you a, a heads up right at the beginning. Uh, the first theme is tough love. But before we look at that, 
enough introduction. We're here to worship God and uh, we're going to sing, The Lord is King, lift up thy voice. And at the end of this, I'm, I'm going to sort of noodle around on the piano for a bit. This is just no tune, just a bit of noodling around to allow you to give time to worship God in your own way and in your own words. So um, I'm not going to offer a prayer of worship. We'll sing our worship and then uh, for just a few minutes afterwards, worship in whatever way or form or words you feel comfortable with or just in the quiet. Let's sing together, the Lord is King. Worship God now in your own words, in the quiet, we bring our praise to God.
One of the key elements of the relationship between a parent and a child is, of course, love. A parent loves their children. But there's also another important component, which is discipline. A child needs to have boundaries set and learn the difference between right and wrong. A child that is allowed to just do whatever it likes is not really being loved. If, if you uh, allow a child to grow up just doing their own thing, if you pamper a child and indulge their every whim, then what you end up with is a spoilt child. That's the word we use to describe that sort of person. They've been spoilt, which is clearly not a good thing. So discipline actually is part of what it means to love a child. Hence the, the phrase that we're looking at today uh, as part of Isaiah's message, tough love. Now I should point out that there is a difference between um, proper discipline as part of a loving relationship and abuse of a child, whether that's physical or emotional abuse. And sadly, uh, some people are on the wrong side of that line. If um, a child lives in fear of physical punishment whenever they step out of line, or if they are constantly uh, browbeaten and, and uh, told off and made to feel worthless. Th these are ab abusive things and, and not any part of tough love. Th there is a, a line between uh, abuse and good discipline. And where that line is drawn perhaps depends largely on what generation you are and what culture you were brought up in. Uh, the older generation uh, and I suppose I include myself in this, will remember the days when, well, the, the caricature is, you know, if you got told off, if you got caught doing something wrong, you'd get a clip round the ear from the local bobby. Uh, and if your mum and dad found about it, you'd get a clip round the, the, the ear again from your dad. Uh, I'm not sure that was quite ever my experience, but uh, you, you know the sort of thing that often gets said, and it's usually followed with, and it never did me any harm, which again may be arguable, I don't know. Uh, but yes, th there was a generation when a physical smack was thought to be perfectly normal. The younger generation may be horrified at any kind of physical uh, punishment, uh, and yet emotional punishment can be just as devastating, if not more so, than physical punishment. So whatever form the discipline takes, it has to be done with, with care. But where you draw the line, okay, yes, that will differ between generations, between cultures. But I think we would all agree there has to be some form of discipline. Sometimes the relationship between God and the people uh, are, is described in terms of a father and his children. Uh, but not today. We're not going to look at that today. I just introduced that concept as a, an introduction to the, the idea of tough love. The image we're going to look at today uh, is actually the, the idea uh, of a, the relationship between a gardener and his garden, or rather a, a vineyard owner and his vineyard. But I choose the word gardener because I think some people who are listening to this might relate to that better. If, if you're a gardener, if you love your garden, how do you treat your garden? How do you look after it? Do you use tough love? Well, let's listen to uh, part of uh, the book of Isaiah and from chapter, this is Isaiah chapter 5. And I'm reading the first seven verses. So this is, this is part of that early uh, story. This is when uh, Judah still existed. They still had a king, um, but things weren't necessarily going as well in, in moral terms as, as they could have done. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. 
My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. And then these next verses are um, the, what the vineyard owner is actually saying himself. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. End quote. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. The image there is of a vineyard owner who expects good things from the, the vines that he's planted, and he doesn't get what he expects. And in his fury, in his disappointment, he says, well, I've had enough. I'll just tear it down, get rid of it. And Isaiah is presenting that as God's attitude towards the people of Israel and the people of Judah. He's saying, that's how God looks on you. You've let him down. You're not the vineyard that he wanted you to be. There are good reasons why the, the people have let God down. And Isaiah goes into some of these in, in other places. For example, the worship of idols. Instead of worshipping the one true God, they, the people would rather run after people, um, idols that are not really gods at all. Uh, the later chapters, uh, when uh, they're in Babylon and, and they'll have seen a lot of Babylonian idols. There's quite a mockery made of how people worship these stone statues and how can you make something and then worship it and call it a god when it's just the work of human hands. You should be worshipping the one true god. There is only one true god. That's a theme that comes out very strongly in the later part of, of Isaiah. But in the early part too, um, people chased after uh, the, the the gods of the, the the lands around them, gods like Baal and uh, other gods that were not gods at all, uh, and somehow they seemed more attractive than the, the gods that they were supposed to be worshipping. Or they put their trust in human agencies. Part of the criticism that Isaiah makes in those early chapters is that people are looking to Egypt to help them. They can see the threat from Assyria in the north and they think what we really need is some allies who are strong enough to stand up to Assyria. And uh, even though Egypt's not always been the best of friends with us, well, let's see if we can get them on our side and make friends with them and maybe they can protect us. Isaiah says, no, no, you've got God on your side. Why do you need stronger human allies? Trust in God. That's what you should be doing. And then there's the business of justice and righteousness. The, the, the things that many prophets, not just Isaiah, complained about, that people are not acting rightly. They're not looking after the vulnerable in society, the widows and the orphans, the people who aren't capable of looking after themselves. They're unfair with their, their, their trade. Uh, they, they use false measures to cheat people. That they, they, they don't uh, run society as it should be run. And the prophets are very critical of these sort of things. God looks 
for his nation to be a just and righteous nation, one that trusts in him, one that looks to him for their needs. And Israel and Judah are not being that. And therefore, there's this threat that you're a vineyard that's going to be torn apart. I'm, I'm done with you. I'm going to tear you down. It has to be said that uh, two ways to try and get people to do what you want them to do uh, are the carrot and the stick. That comes from uh, donkeys, I think. You put a carrot in front of a donkey to a, uh, attract it and lure it forward, uh, a reward for sort of doing the right thing. But the stick is there to beat it when it does the wrong thing. And there's much more of the stick in the Old Testament and in the book of Isaiah than the carrot. But there, is, there are signs of the carrots too. There are promises of hope and, and what life should be like. And this brings me to a, another passage. This is from the later part of Isaiah. But it, it, it's got, again, something of the theme of the garden or the vineyard uh, in there. This is from Isaiah 58, and I'm starting partway through verse 9. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and the malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Thanks be to God for his word through Isaiah. There is hope for the future. If we get things right, God will stand by us. God will treat us like a, a well-watered garden. And those walls that in the earlier part were going to be torn down and thrown away and everything left to rack and ruin, they, they will be rebuilt and restored and, and put right again. The key thing that I, I want to leave you to think about, though, is why is God doing all this? And you could argue that the vineyard owner wants good grapes. He wants to make wine. He's out just to make a profit. But I think there's something more than this going on. And this is why I, I've mentioned the idea of the gardener too. <coughs> Jesus um, picks up this same sort of idea in um, a famous passage from John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the gardener. He, he's... He's the one who looks after the vines. And it can be tough love. It can be uh, that he prunes the vines in order to make them more fruitful. If they're not fruitful at all, they can be uh, stripped off and thrown away and burnt. <coughs> Excuse me. But if they're fruitful, they can be pruned and, and, and bear more fruit. And, and that's a kind of tough love as well. I remember in a previous house, we uh, had a, a very tall tree and we got someone in to, to come and reduce the height. Uh, and um, Sue, my wife, is the gardener. Uh, I'm not a gardener at all, but I was the only one at home when the, the, the tree person came and he and his mates uh, climbed up this tree and they hacked and they sawed and they, they took off the top part and they lopped off branches hither and thither. And, and at the end of it, um, the the uh, the main chap was very proud of what he'd done, and he, he came to me and said, "Right, oh, we've done now. It's a you know a job well done. That that's you know that that's just like we, what we wanted." And I looked at this horrible bare tree, and I thought, "What on earth has he done to it? It's not a good job at all. He's ruined it." I thought, but I, I didn't say so. I'm I'm British and I'm polite, and I said, "Oh, thank you very much," and I gave him the money. But he was right. It, it was a good job. And within a relatively short time, 
the, the leaves had grown and the, the twigs had sprouted and the tree looked beautiful, much better than it had before because it needed badly pruning. It seemed like tough love, but it produced the goods. It made it better. And if you are a gardener, you know that sometimes you, you've got to be ruthless. You've got to prune things back. You, you've got to weed things out, sometimes even uproot things and plant them somewhere else. But why do you do it? And if you are a true gardener, it's because you love your garden. God is not looking after his vineyard because of his own needs. He loves that vineyard. He wants it to be the best vineyard that it can be. And if you're not a gardener, well, maybe there are other ways in which you are creative. A novelist um, loves their novel. It's like their child. And if the editor says, oh, you must get rid of this passage or that passage, the novelist at first may say, no, 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 this is, this is my baby. I can't just get rid of bits. But if he or she wants it to be the best novel that it can be, well, you do have to be ruthless sometimes and get rid of passages that just aren't working. But not for your sake. It's for the sake of the thing that you have created or the thing you're in the process of creating. You love your novel. If you're a gardener, you love your garden. If you are a cook and enjoy cooking, then you love food. You love the food that you make and you want it to be the tastiest and the best. If you're a knitter, you love the garments that you make. Whatever creative acts you're involved in, it's not just because uh, you want to do it for your own benefit. You actually love the thing that you've created and you want it to be the best it can be. That's why God wants the best for us. That's how much God loves us. He wants his vineyard to be the best vineyard and produce the best grapes. He wants his garden to be the most beautiful garden, to be well watered. And sometimes that means tough love to get it the way that not just he wants it, but the way that is best for it. And that's God's relationship with us too. He wants us to be the best human race that we can be. And he's got his work cut out, mind you, to, to make us that. To be the best people we can be. To be the best nation that we can be. He wants us to be the best church we can be. He wants us to be the best community in our local community that we could be. He wants us to be the best individual that we can be. And he won't be satisfied with anything less than that even if it takes tough love to get us to that stage. Amen. Let's sing again and then let's pray for this world and for this nation and for ourselves. We're going to sing for the healing of the nations.
Let us pray. Lord God, we know that you want the best for our world. You want a world of justice and peace. And we are a long, long way from that. We pray that you would help us move towards the kind of world you want us to be. Help us make peace between nations. Help us trade fairly across the nations. Help us end exploitation and oppression. Help us end cruelty and abuse. Lord, we pray for our world and for all its needs. Give us the strength that we need to make it a better place to live. We pray, Lord, for our church and ask that you would strengthen us to be your people in this world, living your values, demonstrating your love in all we say and do. May your blessing rest upon our congregations as we meet to worship and upon all those who are part of our wider fellowship. Whatever contact we have with people, Lord, may we still be united and, and brought together under your love. We pray for our friends and for those particularly who are in need today, for those who are sick, those who are lonely, those who are anxious about the future, those who feel downtrodden or oppressed or unloved. Lord God, help and heal, we pray. And again, show us what we can do to, to bring your hope and your love into the lives of the people we meet. And we pray finally for ourselves and we offer ourselves in your service. Forgive us, Lord, for our mistakes of the past, our, our way, the ways in which we've let you down, our failures, our sins. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to learn better and to do right, to trust you, to love justice, to make peace. Lord, help us to care as you care and to love as you love. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is Lord and Saviour. Amen. And let's join in the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Now may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you today in the coming days and forevermore. Amen.